Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris back again at the Ancient Scholar. Sorry, I've fallen a bit behind on the uh, Venom playlist. Uh, things have been really busy here at work. Uh, we have just uh, opened up a new clinical site um, in, a, in a city where we have to do some commuting. And uh, we've been doing uh, uh, rotations through, we'll, we'll be doing rotations through the operating room. Um, in this particular clinical site, so that's taken a lot of work and a lot of extra time to uh, to uh, get everything together, do the meetings, and uh, go to the the hospital, get oriented, uh, um, get scheduling set up, and and uh, get our students into the the operating room there, um, so they can work on um, airway management, and intubation, um, and those kinds of things. Uh, so now that we've got that done, I actually have a little time. And I wanted to just go ahead and uh, continue talking about the Venom playlist. And so what I wanted to do today is just kind of give you a general idea of where in the country some of these rattlesnakes, some of these pit vipers and uh, um, coral snakes that we, we, we've talked about, primarily these will be uh, the crotalids that I'll be talking about today. So I have a real high fidelity, high tech way that I'm going to do this. So let's go ahead and talk about a really common one the pra the prairie rattlesnake and you can see that the prairie rattlesnake um, has a very large range it's fairly uh, you could say it's fairly isolated about a third of the country in the um, the the west um, part of the country not quite southwest so you've got you know Montana um, all the way you know from Montana the Dakotas Wyoming all the way down New Mexico Arizona Texas Oklahoma uh, parts of Utah Nebraska as well um, all have the prairie rattlesnake um, or areas in them where the prairie, prairie rattlesnake lives. So it's a pretty pretty common snake if you live out west. Um, very common, uh, very easy to run into. Um, so we'll talk about some snakes that don't have the the large the, that type of range. And the, the the first example is the copperhead. Okay, the copperhead uh, rattlesnake. Um, is primarily found in the south um, and, and along the east coast as well, even up, you know, almost up into um, areas. You know, you got a little part of Boston here, not quite up into Maine, but, you know, it's pretty far north, all the way down into the northern part of Florida and then throughout Texas, um, Oklahoma. Um, you got Louisiana, Arkansas as well. Um, so kind of the southeastern and all the way up the uh, northern part. Um, of the east coast you'll find the uh, copperhead rattlesnake or areas where the copperhead rattlesnake is commonly found all right um, i want to talk about uh, two types of snakes now the timber rattlesnake oh, that's in blue and the sidewinder rattlesnake so we talk about the sidewinder here that's the yellow uh, range and the sidewinder rattlesnake is fairly isolated to the southwestern part of the united states so you see um, parts of uh, southern california particularly the deserty more desert areas you have kind of the the southeastern part of arizona so you'd have you know like phoenix would would be in here um this part of arizona here is more forested uh, maybe just a little bit into uh, southern uh, New Mexico, the tip of southern New Mexico. So this would be uh, uh, like a, maybe Skeleton Canyon in that area there. And then this drops down into Mexico, of course. So it's a fairly isolated um, part of the United States. Uh, the timber rattlesnake is found uh, throughout kind of the, the Midwest here. Okay, the Midwest and then part of the South all the way up of uh, the, or at least up parts of the, uh, the Northeastern coast, the East Coast. And again, the timber rattlesnake is primarily located in areas where you have lots of vegetation. So you see that, uh, for example, the Eastern part of Texas has it. And then as you move West, of course, uh, Texas becomes more and more dry until you get over here into the El Paso area, which is a, which is a pretty much a desert, uh, pretty much an extension of the Chihuahuan Desert. So you don't see the timber rattlesnakes in these desert climates like you see, like the sidewinder is actually evolved in the way that the sidewinding way it moves. It actually um, prefers the sand, and so you don't see the sidewinder evolve in areas where you have uh, lots of moisture, 
um, lots of, of vegetation. So you have these really highly vegetated areas where the timber rattlesnake is found, hence the term timber, talking about wooded, you know, thick wooded areas. Okay, um, the cottonmouth or the water moccasin. Uh, again, um, you can see that, you know, a lot of Texas may have, you know, parts of it. This doesn't say that, like, the entire part that's shaded is where you'll find the snake everywhere. But in general, this is more of a general drawing that I did. Um, and again, you can see the cottonmouth has somewhat of a similar range to the timber rattlesnake. Um, the cottonmouth, of course, is a semi-aquatic snake. So you're not really going to see it, okay, in this these, this area of the country here where it's very it's very desert-like. You don't have a whole lot of water, a whole lot of vegetation, and and lot uh, lots of water like you do pretty much throughout the South here, and throughout areas where you have lots of water and um, reasonably temperate weather. Okay, all right. Moving on, another type of snake, the uh, diamondback. And, of course, we have the western diamondback, which is found throughout the southwestern part of the United States, throughout Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and, of course, the um, southern part of California. And then you have the eastern diamondback, which is fairly isolated to, uh, you've got Florida, Georgia, um, the kind of this, this area here. Um, so the, they're kind of two pockets, uh, two reasonably isolated pockets of the United States where you find the western, um, more west and the eastern, of course, more east. Uh, these are both more southern, and you don't see the diamondbacks as much in the, the northern latitudes of the United States. Um, the next one, this is one of the big baddies here. This is the southern Pacific rattlesnake, and you can see that the southern Pacific rattlesnake is pretty much uh, more or less in the southern part um, of the Pacific part of the United States. Um, but you do see that range kind of extend up into the um, Pacific Northwest as well. Um, and then it kind of extends a little bit out into some of these other states. But in general, it the, the population is more concentrated along the uh, California Pacific coast of California, and then it kind of branches out into some of the other other states. Uh, the Mojave rattlesnake is another one of them big baddies, right? And the Mojave uh, rattlesnake is fairly isolated, uh, somewhat like the sidewinder. It's fairly isolated um, to the southern part of the United States, specifically the southwest, not the southeast, the southwest. So you see it in California, uh, Arizona, a little bit of New Mexico and Texas, and it kind of this extends down into um, uh, Mexico here. Uh, again, another one of the big baddies. And then finally, the only elapid that I'll be talking about, the coral snake. And of course, there are different types of coral snakes, uh, venomous coral snakes. There are coral snakes that tend to be more eastern, southeastern located. So again, you have you know the, 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 the Bible Belt type southern states in Florida and parts of Texas. And then you have the more western location of the coral snake, primarily Arizona, and a little bit into, uh, into, into New Mexico, again, kind of a skeleton camp. I just happen to know this area of New Mexico uh, reasonably well. Um, so I know some of the specific locations here, but primarily in, in, in Arizona and then throughout uh, Texas and the, uh, the, the quote-unquote deep south. Um, so what's the moral of the story when it comes to the United States? Well, let's see if I can kind of, okay, take all my pictures here the best I can. And I'm going to do something, and I want you guys to... We'll take a look and see if we can infer anything. Make just some general inferences from all of these. All right. So what are the general inferences? Well, I think the general inferences is um, if you are really, really concerned about uh, pit viper envenomation and, and you don't want to deal with it, 
you probably don't want to live in the southwestern part of the United States. While many other parts of the U.S. have many other snakes, it's pretty clear that states like Arizona, or Arizona, uh, California, okay, if you look at these places, Arizona and California and Texas have high concentrations of multiple uh, subtypes or multiple species of, of uh, lapids and uh, coral snakes. Um, and indeed, California particularly has a lot of envenomations. They have ERs, uh, Loma Lida being one of them, that are really specialized at dealing with uh, snake envenomations. So um, I think that's a really good uh, overview of uh, the general area of the United States where these snakes are located. Um, I would say another inference is uh, when you look at Alaska and you look at Hawaii, you don't really have indigenous uh, venomous snakes located in those states other than snakes that may be imported in exotic snakes in aquariums, at homes, and in zoos and things of that nature, which I really haven't talked about in any detail. Uh, the last thing I want to say is just in general, the uh, snake season, so when the most envenomations occur, uh, tend to be the warmer months of the year, uh, and it tends to span from about, Oct uh, from about May uh, to October. So uh, the end of spring, the beginning of summer, to the end of summer, the beginning of fall. And when we see the snakes, generally in October, when the weather gets cooler, and this includes it in the south, uh, southern part of the United States as well. Uh, the snakes will uh, tend to go into dens. Uh, sometimes several, uh, several, many, many snakes will den together and they'll go through their um, hibernation and then when it warms up they come out of hibernation. Uh, we generally see snakes uh, tend to be a bit more active in uh, the mornings and the afternoons. In the mornings the snakes will kind of They'll get out and they'll they'll bask themselves on rocks that tend to absorb sunlight and heat up, and then in the afternoon the the snakes may kind of go into you know shaded areas um, to you know shade themselves or if it's a cool day they may be out on the rock um, uh, trying to warm up as the as the day as the day becomes uh, carries on. Um, so you don't really run into snakes during the colder months because they're generally in hibernation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and cut the video off here. In the next video, I will talk about uh, guidelines and protocols for treating um, the crotalid envenomation in the United States using um, the Crofab antivenom. As always, thanks for hanging in there, guys.